All right, well, thank, thank you very much, Pat, for that introduction. Um, and uh, I can see um, a lot of people have filled in in the Zoom. I'm really delighted to see um, some relatives from Florida. Um, the furthest traveled award doesn't go to Mike, it doesn't go to Steve in California. It goes once again to Mike Ackerberg's down in Brazil, who was uh, in our classes. Um, but I'm, I'm really happy that to see a number of the members of the uh, of the club from New York have joined in to, uh, to, to this presentation tonight as well. Uh, so let me share my screen and whoops, you don't want to see that. Um, the, uh, put this in full mode. Okay, so these are the topics I'm going to cover tonight. Um, some, some stuff about um, myself, like one slide about me. Um, then an overview of the this um, urban astrophotography hobby, and I'll show some of the urban AP greatest hits. Uh, then I'll do uh, a little bit of gearhead stuff. There have been some new product introductions for um, portable uh, mounts that uh, I think for anybody who's interested in pursuing this hobby are, are worth knowing about. I'll show some of my more recent solar stuff. I've been doing a lot of solar imaging. And then uh, for the, the last part, I want to talk about everyday AI because I see uh, artificial intelligence has come into um, some of our image processing gear and uh, it's making some things even easier than they were before. So I have a demonstration of that capability. Uh, so, uh, and, and these times of course are approximate, but it's about, uh, about an hour's worth of stuff. So to, to sort of fill in um, my, my background, how, how I wound up doing this stuff, um, I'm you know, a child of the 60s. I, um, I, I just want to check and make sure that, yeah, so my slides uh, advanced. Uh, the, um, the, the day that JFK was shot was a day that um, I was on a class trip to Hayden Planetarium. So there are things about the Hayden Planetarium that are you know, sort of lodged in compartments in my brain that are associated with, you know, this day that everyone knows exactly where they were. Uh, and uh, that's one of the astro benchmarks for me as a kid. Another is uh, growing up in Queens in 1965, we had this gigantic blackout. And uh, one of the fun things we did was we had my brother's telescope out in the lawn and it's, I think it's the first time I saw the Galilean moons of Jupiter. So that also uh, stuck in my mind. And then of course we had the space program, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, uh, uh, the picture here of the moon landing from 1969, but all through the Mercury program and, uh, and, and beyond, we, it was a big deal in the New York City public schools, they'd roll in these giant, um, TVs to show us the launches as they were happening. So, you know, we all had that sort of excitement and, and that stuff stuck with me. Um, I didn't really uh, pursue astronomy in any significant way. I took like one course at, at MIT, but at MIT, I did get into photography. I took uh, creative photography and then I was doing electron microscopy and exposed to other kinds of imaging and so on. So, so that part of of, of my sort of hobby space um, really got fed during those years. And then I like, I worked and stuff for, you know, 30 whatever years in medical product development where uh, periodically imaging related things were related. And I, I see a little bit more of that now working with some medical innovation startups. Um, but I, I really didn't have time for astronomy, let alone astrophotography. Um, this, this changed initially when uh, in 2004, Smart Money Magazine had an article on telescopes. And I just wanted to you know, make sure it was clear. It wasn't Sky and Telescope that got me back into the hobby. It was Smart Money Magazine. But it was a great article. And it, it talked about, they gave uh, some um, relatively inexpensive, go, new, but new at the time, go-to scopes to people to evaluate. And the winning telescope was a TV-85. And the people just loved it. The, you know, the optics were impeccable. And I just got kind of really excited from that article. So I wound up 
um, you know, speaking with Dave Nagler at Teleview and buying myself one of these, I'm like, you know, I was like, I'm a grown up. I want to have my own telescope. I'm, I'm going to do it. So I, I did that in 19, in 2005. And, uh, and I used that to observe Jupiter, Saturn, uh, Orion Nebula, and a few other things. Um, then I got obsessed again in 2012 when for work, I was traveling down to Pennsylvania a lot. And uh, uh, on one trip, I, I drove past the Questar factory in, in um, New Hope, Pennsylvania. And I was like, it just triggered this thought like Questar, you know, Questar. I remember Questar from Scientific American ads when, uh, when, when we were in college and high school and college and, and these telescopes are supposed to be great. And I started researching them and thinking about them. But also at that time, while I was thinking about getting a Questar, um, I found a lot of material uh, created by uh, Princeton professors, a pres professor of uh, applied math named Robert Vanderby. And he did a lot of uh, superb work in, you know, in and around, I don't know, 2008 to 2012 on imaging with his Questar using CCD cameras and software available at the time. And he, he was pretty good at it. And he, he wrote a lot of stuff. Uh, so I kind of studied his stuff thinking, you know, man, I, I, I'd like to try that and see if it works. Um, and then it became easier for me to allocate time to this when um, I, I, you know, I completed my 31 year tour, tour of duty advisor in 2014 and retired. And now uh, this is something I could uh, allocate a lot of time to. So I started, really started trying astrophotography around then. And uh, then through family, I was introduced to Larry and, and WAA in 2014. And I joined the New York City Club in 2016. And I'll talk about that, that period a little more here. So when I got started, I was interested in answering two questions. The first was, could I actually do astrophotography with this little telescope? Uh, Vanderby had done it. But Vanderby was down in Princeton, and that was about three times the distance from Times Square that I'm up, I am here on the, like the Yonkers Scarsdale border. So I didn't know, is light pollution going to be a much bigger problem for me? Am I going to be able to do this stuff? How hard is it going to be? What's the deal going to be? So when I started doing it, um, uh, you know, it was very time and uh, energy intensive. There's a steep learning curve, but I was consistently surprised by just how much stuff I could do from my backyard with this little telescope. And all of these images are from that era. So it, that actually prompted me to want to do more, but to go in a, an unusual direction, which was if I can do all this stuff from close in suburbs, which from a light pollution standpoint, we refer to it as a, a red zone. What is possible from a white zone like Manhattan? Um, and so in order to get imaging time uh, in on the island of Manhattan, I joined up with AAA.org and started uh, regularly going to outreach on the High Line. And so you know, here, I just want to underscore another component of the way that I think about urban astrophotography is that ultra portable gear, gear where you can get everything into a backpack, have both hands free, and then travel by train and subway to, to a venue um, and sort of set up, take down easily. Uh, so small portable gear is also an important component of, of, of the, the hobby. And these are sort of their images from those, but from the High Line. This is 12th Street and, and 12th Avenue. Um, and, uh, you know, I was able to hit the Andromeda Nebula. Uh, I use the Vale Nebula frequently as a, uh, a target for outreach discussions. But I could do all of this. And so I got a sense that white, you know, white zone imaging um, and electronic EAA, electronic observation, uh, even from Manhattan was feasible. So the outreach kind of came ground to a halt with the pandemic. And the last three years, what I've been working on at home, a lot of you know, methods improvement, trying to learn uh, new 
uh, software or techniques, uh, you know, see what works, what doesn't work. Um, but also we uh, taught several rounds of urban astrophotography with the New York Club at uh, AAA.org. And, and I know I had a, a number of uh, members, uh, people who came to the class uh, who uh, I kind of recruited from Westchester Amateur Astronomers as well. So uh, this course was uh, really uh, Alfredo Viegas, who's now the, um, the, the chairing AAA.org, and I kind of structured urban astrophotography and we ran several sessions of that and figured out how to do the course as well via Zoom. Uh, so this is just a screen grab of uh, my doing a Jupiter capture demo. And, um, uh, and we had a, a few dozen people go through the course over the past couple of years. And that was, that was very satisfying. And again, uh, so some of them uh, have zoomed in here even all the way from Brazil. So uh, that was pretty satisfying. So moving on from that, that background, I just want to underscore this sort of central message of what I've been up to the past four, few years, which is um, technology, there, there's, there, there's been a lot of evolution of the technology and it has really unlocked the sky from my perspective for backyard imagers, um, you know, making uh, deep sky targets available even from suburbs and even from white zones like uh, the cities overcoming light pollution. And I just want to spend a couple of minutes just kind of traipsing through um, the most important uh, and recent technological changes. So, and I, I think of, you know, recent, when I think about this, I encounter a lot of people in the clubs who've been into astronomy hobbies a lot longer than I have and um, may have even tried imaging around 2007, 2012, or whatever. There's a lot of stuff that's happened since 2015 that's changed the hobby. So, so first and foremost are the cameras. Uh, if you think of astrophotography as CCD imaging, you're, you're out of date. The camera technology has all switched over, uh, certainly in the, in the amateur portion of the market, um, to the CMOS cameras which are ubiquitous. Those are the cameras in our cell phones. Those are the, cam the, the camera chips that are being used for sensors and self-driving cars and, and, and factories and, and so on. And the, that chip technology um, is uh, better in several ways than the CCD technology of let's say 2010, 2012. Um, it's cheaper, the cameras are more sensitive and they have uh, a, a, an important attribute that called uh, read noise. They have much lower read noise. And that enables the use of capture software that can be used to do um, what we call live stacking with very short exposures. So that instead of using an old CCD camera and needing to set up your gear and your mount to um, accurately track the sky for five minutes, 10 minutes at a time. Um, I do a lot of imaging now at four seconds and eight seconds, but I accumulate, I accumulate that stuff. So uh, it, it, it enables me to, you know, this is from my backyard. This is the North America nebula over my house. The uh, eight second exposures that I did with this uh, are controlled by the software called SharpCap, which was SharpCap really became popular in concert with these CMOS cameras since 2016, 2015, 2016, and it really enables um, uh, the, the, the hobby to be done more easily. It enables uh, real-time electronic viewing to be done more readily, uh, and, and the software is great, and he continues to develop it and improve it, and I keep finding new cool features in it. Um, those short exposures also impact the, the requirements for mounts. So again, I talked about being able to put 20 pounds or less of gear on my back. Um, if you go back to conventional wisdom from around 2010 about getting into astrophotography, people would say, spend all your money on the best mount you could get. Make sure you have a you know big mount that's rock steady and so on. And um, this ability to do short exposure imaging takes a lot of the stress off the requirements for these mounts. 
Um, and so portable go-to mounts, another, another thing about shooting at deep sky targets compared to um, like planets like Jupiter and Saturn is, uh, you know, even from, even from Manhattan, if you want to point a telescope at Jupiter or Saturn, you point the tele telescope at Jupiter or Saturn. If you want to point the telescope at the North American Nebula, well, it's completely invisible. So the go-to capability of more modern mounts and the ability to control that easily makes a huge difference in terms of, again, opening up the sky, opening up the targets that would be otherwise invisible. Uh, so I'm going to talk a little more about some of the more um, current mount, portable mount offerings. Uh, two other items, uh, overall processing software, uh, PixInsight, this is you know, screen, screen grab of PixInsight, but as I mentioned uh, in the last portion of this presentation, I'm going to talk about some of the ways that artificial intelligence is creeping in and making it even easier to use less than perfect uh, image captures and get better results. And, uh, and then another thing that's changed in the past few years is the existence of dual band filters. So uh, for um, light polluted imaging or urban astrophotography in the past, the technique of using narrow band filters has been around for a while. Uh, people would, would put on a filter that only passes this very narrow wavelength of red. That's the hydrogen alpha wavelength that these, these great big nebular regions have. It's just like a, a, an interstellar cloud of dust and crap, but most of that dust and crap is protons. It's, it's high hydrogen and it happens to glow this shade of red. If you filtered out all of their wavelengths, you could eliminate light pollution and have the nebular targets shine through. So, um, so there was a lot of uh, the state of the art imaging it used to be used a mono camera and, and a sequence of narrow band filters to deal with it. Um, only since around 2015 have filters become commonplace that have only pass um, the, the key narrow band wavelengths of hydrogen alpha and the blue from oxygen uh, in one filter. So these filters could be paired with these color cameras. And, and again, uh, 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 the steps that used to require using a monochrome camera and a filter wheel and doing a lot of changes and gathering a lot of stuff um, have sort of collapsed down to a much simpler process. So um, it's, uh, you know, there, there's an intended message here for people who might have dabbled in the hobby over a decade ago that maybe you, you, know, you might wanna think about taking a, a, a fresher look or for people who are you know, a little intimidated by what they know and have heard about astrophotography. And, and that course that we've been teaching at, at AAA.org is, is meant to sort of help get people get um, you know, sort of up the initial learning curves and think about whether they really wanna jump in with both feet. Okay, so let's, uh, let's move on then to Urban astrophotography greatest hits. Now, uh, you've seen. I think um, one of one of Bob's slides, uh, or ha had, a, or maybe one of Jordan Jordan's slides. One of Jordan's slides about the planets had a, uh, an image of Jupiter that had a lot more detail than this one. Uh, but but keep in mind that almost everything I'm showing here, certainly the planetary stuff, is done with this a three and a half inch Questar scope that any you know any goddess can carry in one hand and I could as well. So, um, so you know, people with, with bigger telescopes might be able to see and get even more detail, but uh, the gas giants as imaging targets, they're, they're very bright. So there are plenty of excellent images shot from cities. And, like it, and if you're familiar with great photographs of Jupiter, uh, the guy who's sort of like the pace setter, Christopher Goh, um, images from a place called Cebu, setting, Cebu City in the, in the Philippines, that's, you know, it's a city. Uh, uh, and uh, he's not out in the, you know, on a mountaintop in Chile, he's, he's in a city. And you, could, you can get away with that for Jupiter because Jupiter is very bright. And then Jupiter has a lot of stuff going on. And my point here is that a well-executed small scope image um, 
can reveal detail associated with bigger scopes. Looking through my quest star, I see the stripes on the face of Jupiter. I would need, you'd need, I mean, there's no chance basically of visually seeing all this stuff, but the camera, a little bit of practice and a little bit of time at the computer, I can use the same telescope and access all of this detail. So I'll come back to Jupiter a couple of times in the presentation. Moving on to Saturn, Saturn's a little bit different because in that regard, uh, through an eyepiece, Saturn shows nearly all the detail of a backyard image, right? So Saturn is like a great fun target to look at. And an outreach on the High Line, I mean, I've, I once had a, like a, a middle-aged French woman, maybe it was the first time she'd actually seen Saturn through a telescope. So people who do outreach have this kind of experience. She looks at it and she's like, she, she came away, she was like crying because of uh, the view of Saturn. Um, the thing is that the, 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 the actual detail on the surface of Saturn, there's, it, there's not a lot to grab onto. Uh, so imaging um, really just uh, you know, recaps what, what we see through telescope, I think of almost any given size. Mars is uh, in that regard, uh, a little more like Jupiter. So Mars was uh, at opposition in the summer of 2020 during the pandemic. It was as close as gonna be till I think it's 2038 or something like that. Um, and, uh, and, and one, there was a, a dust storm early in this period. Once that cleared away all summer, uh, people were out imaging Mars. And, and again, I was able with my little quest star to get this image of uh, that, that stuff is, um, you know, it's, is the, the surface detail, the features of their sort of continents and great regions on, on Mars. And I was very happy with the level that I could extract. And again, it's certainly very different from the experience of looking through the eyepiece and dealing with, um, you know, what's technically called seeing, uh, but basically atmospheric crud and 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 um, uh, atmospheric um, distortion that makes it very hard to see this clearly um, through the eyepiece. But but again, with a little bit of effort, uh, a, a camera reveals all this stuff. Okay, so that's the planets. Those are the bright things. Moving on to deep sky targets. So the first one I'm showing here, M42, everyone should figure out at one point or another how to try to image M42 from wherever you are. M42, the Orion Nebula. So this is, you know, if, if, if you're not super familiar with it, if when you look at Orion and Everybody should know Orion in the in the autumn sky. Um, uh, there are the three stars in the belt, and then hanging off the belt is the sword. And um, the the middle star in the sword is kind of fuzzy. And so you shine, you aim your telescope at it, and you see this very central portion that I'm. I hope you can see my cursor just over here. Whoops, just over here. This very bright part. And to me, that very bright part, when I had that teleview, my TV 85 from my backyard, and I, and I would like go out for an evening of observation, I was just fascinated by that. It wasn't until I hooked up a camera, um, you know, years later, that I became aware of all of this stuff, this incredible nebular structure around Orion that is just a favorite colorful target for um, big telescopes, EAA, and, um, and certainly astrophotographers of, of, of any level. Um, if you're, that, that core is so bright that when you're starting out, it's actually tricky to learn what you need to learn to get an image like this, but it's, it's not, it's easier than ever to do it. Um, so, Again, with this image, I've included this picture from the High Line a few years ago, just to show the setup. This is done with my Borg 55 FL. It's basically a glorified um, uh, camera telephoto lens, and uh, it's on this little portable tracking mount. Um, and uh, we, you know, it could hit it. it could hit the M42 in the right season from from the High Line. Um, so, so now moving to 
sorts of things that I only learned about when I started doing astrophotography. The Rosette, the Rosette Nebula is a, it's, it's actually a very big structure. This is about, um, I think it's about four times, this image would be about four times the width of the moon, right? So eight degrees from side to side in, the, in this image. The uh, Rosette Nebula is this big structure sort of hanging off the, uh, it's, it's off to the east of Orion's shoulder. And it's kind of invisible unless you use a camera or uh, one of those hydrogen alpha filters, because again, most of the structure is this, this red cloud of hydrogen. It's around a, uh, surrounds a, this, the, this central group of stars is, um, it's consistently described as uh, the, a hot young stars. And I, I love that phrase for tagging an Instagram to see if I get some extra attention. But um, the, uh, the, 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 the point about this target is, is that because it's um, really an H alpha target, we can image it, I, I believe we can image it as well, certainly from the suburbs, and I think even in, from Manhattan, as from dark sky sites, when people are, are meticulous about the, uh, about the way that they do it. And, and certainly um, one of our members in, in uh, New York, he's moved back out to LA, but Alex Weinstein uh, had like a rooftop um, set up in, uh, in Chelsea and, uh, and he did some uh, great images of targets like this. And, um, I, and I, I think this kind of target, we, can, we could nail it even through light pollution. In this case, I use slightly bigger gear, but this is a modular bore gear. I could probably jam it in a backpack if I, if I um, needed to. Um, like, but like if my life depended on it, it's not as not as portable as as the other stuff. But but um, I use this rig. I have it set up right now, and I can move this around. I move it from my dining room out to the backyard with one hand. I can reposition it with one hand. So so again, the ultra portable element is important to me. Another similar similar grand nebular target that we can do a good job on uh, from the light polluted areas is the North American Nebula, which should be able to figure out why it's called the North American Nebula, and the Pelican Nebula right next to it, which should be able to figure out why it's called the Pelican Nebula. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's a grand summer target. It's uh, up now. And um, you know this is one of those targets that I'd see this in the veil. I'd see on my sky charts in those years before I started doing imaging. And I'm like, I don't even know what that is. I point my telescope towards it and it's like, there's nothing there. But once you incorporate a hydrogen alpha filter and certainly once you incorporate um, extended exposure astrophotography, uh, this is quite accessible from the light polluted zones. I mentioned before that one of my favorite targets from the High Line, um, partly because it, it, it's, it, the timing was good for uh, when it was in the sky and, and how accessible it was to the target. But this is one of my favorites for outreach on the High Line because I, I could hit it pretty well with my rig with the dual band filter. And, uh, and, and it's great, it's, it's fascinating. I mean, you can't look at this, it's called the, the Cygnus loop. You can't look at it without being able to kind of identify that, uh, you know, at some point a few thousand years ago, a star over here where my cursor is, a star blew up and ejected all this stuff into space. And the stuff it ejected happens to have, again, a lot of the hydrogen. And this also has a big um, oxygen component that comes through blue through the narrow band filters. So, um, so this has been sort of an exciting target. And it's fun to talk about not only the star exploding, but the history of this target and the Harvard Observatory and why Pickering's triangle was actually discovered by Pickering's maid. And the, uh, the, it, it ties into the, the history of women in, in science to uh, hear the story of um, how uh, people understood the structure and imaged it earlier on in the, in the 20th century. Um, it, it's one of my favorites. It's also a great target for illustrating a few other things. So here, here I've got the, you know, so the main, the brighter components, the Eastern Veil, the Western Veil, also referred to as the witch's broom. 
So here's detail from a more recent dual band version that I did last summer um, and blown up using the dual band filter and four second exposures over my house from, from Yonkers. Um, there's a, a lot of detail here. And, and I wanted to draw a comparison to you know, my early days in, I, I spent the whole summer, literally of 2015, I, ha I spent the summer I had like, I made this summer project can I image the Eastern Vale Nebula well with my Questar? The Questar um, the field of view is only a third of this. So, so this is actually a three panel mosaic, but for each panel, I, need, I did three nights of capture of narrow band and then broadband in order to do it. And then I spent like a million hours processing this in PixInsight and using their um, mosaic capability put this picture together. Fast forward six years later in 2021, I used my Borg setup, um, capture the image in one night with four second exposures and then cropping way into, there, there's so much resolution off that chip, I could crop way into it. Um, and you know maybe it's four hours of processing time in total to end up with a materially better result. So a little bit of this is my own learning curve and uh, sort of, you know, coming up the curve in terms of capability. But a lot of it is linked to those differences in technology that I highlighted earlier. Um, and then my, f uh, my final deep sky um, target that I wanted to talk about is the crab nebula and uh, I won't tell you the whole story, but uh, the article that I wrote in the February 2022 Skywatch on page nine um, in there, I, I wrote it up describing uh, again my that same progress, that trajectory over time in what the impact was of different technology and different techniques on being able to image the crab nebula uh, from my yard and, uh, and and I hope you read that and enjoy that and, and and this but this image that I did last in December, I'm I'm really kind of proud for of the amount of um, of detail that's in there, uh, and and I will come back to that. Oh, so that's not the end of my deep sky stuff. It's the end of my colorful deep sky stuff. I did want to also talk about galaxies. Um, so for galaxies we don't have the advantage of filtering out all the light pollution that we don't want by using those narrow band filters. Uh, when you're imaging a galaxy, like this is the Andromeda galaxy, two and a half million light years away in space, it's a trillion stars in the picture. Um, we, when you're imaging a galaxy, you really want to capture all the wavelengths. You need all of the, uh, the, the whole spectrum. So the techniques are a little bit different. Um, what comes into play for suburban imaging is uh, more total exposure time to work with. So this image is uh, still you know, three nights of capture and six and a half hours of total exposure time. And each exposure is four or eight seconds, but there's you know, thousands of them used to create this, this image. And uh, I feel like this, you know, again, for like Andromeda over my house in Yonkers, I, I think this is a, a serviceable image. Uh, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that in the AI portion of the discussion. Um, another galaxy that we end up imaging a lot is M51. It's um, in part because it's very photogenic. <coughs> It's also prominent in the sky in April when we go to NEF and buy gear and then want to test it out in something on something. So I've I've uh, the M fifty one has been my first light target for a number of things I've I've wound up procuring at NEF in uh, which is typically in April. Um, and uh, I've also done an experiment on this with my small gear. So uh, I use the Borg 71 FL. So again, the aperture of this telescope is 71 millimeters. 
And I have a data set that Alfredo Villegas gave me from his um, C11, a, a Celestron 11 inch telescope uh, that he uses at uh, his home in Connecticut. And he had this really nice data set with um, a good like two hours of capture, but on this much bigger scope. And um, I, I set up an experiment uses sort of slices of his data to compare to um, at, at any given time, there's 16 times as many photons coming through his C11 as my 71 millimeter meter meter lens. Um, so if I adjusted the time, and uh, say looked at how my nine and a half hour uh, exposure and image compared to his image of the equivalent was about 30 minutes. Um, they're really close in terms of the type of detail revealed in the center of the galaxy and so on. So I, I use this as a benchmark that, you know, if I, I think it's plausible for, that for a lot of these kind of brighter greatest hits targets, um, even in white and in, in certainly in red zones and in white zones, we can um, we can match uh, images from darker locations or bigger telescopes just by accumulating enough data over many, many hours. And the last galaxy that I'm going to show is Leo Trio, because again, I've hit it from the High Line. I've hit it from my Manhattan myself. Uh, I haven't had time to gather enough data to do a, uh, a nice image. Uh, so this is from my backyard, actually. But these are three galaxies. It's like three galaxies in one shot. Um, they're 35 million light years off in space. And uh, you get one edge on, one that's kind of cool, along with these two. And it's uh, a fun target for a bunch of reasons, but again, one that I know we can do uh, uh, pretty much as nice a job from um, from from the metropolitan area as as uh, from you know a typical backyard in Indiana or a relatively dark sky site. So. That's the end of my greatest hits portion. I'm going to move on now to uh, some of the gearhead stuff. Um, so I'm doing this. My, my portable rig has depended on a, a product from Ioptron called a Cube Pro um, that they, uh, they, they stopped selling it. Uh, I think they've stopped making it and they stopped selling it. So um, this is a little problematic for our um, urban astrophotography course and coming up with a recommendation for it. But uh, this product had a lot of, had, had, I, I've got two of them because they're also not that expensive. And, um, you know, it fits well in a backpack. It's about five pounds. It has go-to capability. I can control it with, uh, with the software on my laptop. It runs on eight rechargeable, rechargeable batteries. So power is not a problem. And it handles my portable equipment it's, uh, it doesn't handle like my TV85, which is still a portable telescope, but uh, the gear that I bought specifically for lightweight, um, it handles it really well and it can be auto guided and stuff like that. So we've been very conscious of, you know, what are the best alternatives for that for anyone who really wanted to try to duplicate kind of a portable setup. And of course, uh, even people who have big setups in the suburbs or wherever you are um, and, uh, you know, much more um, uh, rugged, big sets of gear might be interested in having a portable setup for those times when you go out to Cherry Springs, Springs or a family trip or whatever to a dark sky site and want to be able to, um, to do um, imaging. Uh, so, so these portable mounts are, are important. And a, a favorite recommendation is, has been the Skywatcher Star Adventurer. It's a very sturdy product. It tracks really well, but it, there's no go-to. And so it requires, uh, you know, it's great with sort of wide angle stuff for uh, a telescope at a higher power. Uh, it, it, it's, it could be a little bit of a chore to, to work with. At the other end of the scale, um, uh, people who were at NEEF in, I forget if it was 2018 or 2019, when Rainbow Astro showed up with this robotic mount for 
$7,000. And, and Larry and I and a few friends from imaging people from the New York club or whatever, we kept dragging each other back over to uh, their booth at Neef to look at this $7,000 robotic mount. The company made, I don't know, they made robots for exploration of Mars or whatever. And uh, they configured this, this actually really nice product that uses a harmonic drive technology instead of the typical gear drives in more conventional mounts. And the big advantage of these uh, uh, harmonic mounts is that for a device that's roughly the same size as either this one, the AZ GTI from Skywatcher or my Cube Pro, very similar size and weight, but this thing can handle like 30 pounds without a counterweight, without worrying about balancing the scope too much. So the weight capacity of this mount um, is, is amazing. Uh, what, you know, I was able to do the math in my head if like I could pay $7,000 for this or buy, you know, uh, a dozen Cube Pros. Uh, so, um, so I bought an extra Cube Pro right then and there, but it, the, the point is this has been on my, you know, like uh, my list of gifts I might buy myself someday. And the price has come down. They, they've been distributing through, uh, so started distributing through Tolga, I think is in New Jersey, Tolga Astro. And uh, the price came, came, came down a bit, but it's still a kind of a premium object. And, uh, and we like, you know, our default recommendation became this, this mount, Skywatcher AZ GTI, and it's and it's not a bad choice for anyone who wants to try to get into ultra portable urban astronomy. Big news um, a few months ago is that uh, ZWO, uh, uh, the camera um, manufacturer from China, that's uh, really you know, become the dominant force in the amateur camera market. ZWO announced their harmonic drive. It's very similar design uh, to the Rainbow Astro product uh, with very similar capabilities, but they set the $2,000 price point to make it more accessible. So I think this is a product that a lot of people, you know, sort of like uh, raised a lot of interest. And I think we're, we're basically waiting for uh, them to start shipping these things and to see what the real user reviews are like. Uh, they had, um, a, a, you know, four months ago, they said they'd be shipping in April, then it became June. I, I don't know if they started yet. So if you're really interested, you know, sort of monitor cloudy nights forum to, to, to see, um, uh, I'm sure people will be reporting in on their experience with that. Um, and then just last month, it went, as I was putting this presentation together, um, Ioptron announced that they're making a harmonic drive mount, also around the $2,000 price point. And in their case, it's, uh, it's a hybrid of, with a harmonic drive on the, um, the RA axis, that's the axis that tracks the Earth's rotation and a more conventional mount, uh, a more conventional geared uh, motor drive on the on the the declination drive that controls how you know how high in the sky it's it's aimed, um, and uh, so they have announced that they've got a lot of information about it on their website. Um, it looks like that uh, at least one vendor says that. Uh, you know, order now for delivery in the middle of 2023. So we'll see. But I, the point is that if you're, you know, sort of pondering this and want to edge into it, just be aware that the options for gear are evolving quickly and you might have different choices in about 18 months from what you'd have today. And then at a more, a little more friendly price point, uh, in this case, like $640, and likely sooner availability, Skywatcher has now built a go-to version of their Star Adventurer. Um, to me, the product looks a little bit bulky. It looks like a Star Adventurer on top of another Star Adventurer, but it uses their uh, GTI go-to capabilities. So I'm sure all the drivers and everything will be 
uh, you know, compatible for people and easy to set up. So I, so I think this will be um, a good option for people who, you know, you're stretching a budget or whatever, uh, a choice depending on what you really need and care about between this and maybe their AZ GTI um, uh, before um, moving up to the $2,000 sort of level for those harmonic drives. All right, that's probably about as much gearhead stuff as anyone can tolerate. So I'm gonna to change topics again to solar. I've been doing a lot of solar. Uh, I think I've pre presented at both WAA and, uh, and, and uh, New York Club on um, H-alpha solar imaging more recently. Um, so this is a picture of my setup with the Questar and a Daystar Quark that I bought uh, again, from the Daystar team at NEF a couple of years ago. And the following year, I went and, uh, and had them um, help me get outfitted for uh, astrophotography. So um, I, I'm, I'm finding um, the question, and you need one more filter to, if you point a reflector scope like the Questar directly at the sun, the innards melt. So you need this additional energy rejection filter and those have some interesting requirements. So this is, this is also another, I don't know, $800 or whatever on top of that. But, uh, but this setup, I, I, I really enjoy using it and I've been able to control it well recently. And, um, and, and I use it to do this recent image of the sun. So the, the thing about talking about the sun is the sun has, has gone nuts in recent months um, it's, uh, I, I bought that gear here. This is, uh, the solar cycles, uh, like 11 years, trough to trough or peak to peak. And, uh, it's, you know, the, it's, it's measured, it's quantified with sunspots. So when I, when I bought my gear at, I, I was right in the, this minimum here, um, around that bottomed out in 2020. And then the sun started bottoming out and coming out of it. And, and as it moves up in uh, visible activity, um, it actually goes up really steeply. So the solar activity in terms of sunspots and prominences and coronal mass ejections getting hurled at earth, causing auroras and stuff like that, we've, we've already hit a level that's uh, about as high as it has, has been, because the last cycle was kind of wimpy. So we're just about the best we've been in 15 years, and it's going to keep getting better um, up through, uh, I guess it's, this is about 2025. Uh, so, so it, you know, never been a better time to get into solar, solar imaging. And uh, by the way, like Bob, I, was, I just stole this slide from a recent uh, the, this graphic from Sky and Telescope, and hope they're not paying attention. Um, but that, so this increase in solar activity pays other dividends. So the pandemic forced us to cancel a trip we were going to take to Norway in March of 2020. To um, uh, the trip was structured around ensuring that we'd be able to see aurora. So we spent seven nights above the Arctic Circle, which we were told would guarantee we'd see aurora, uh, and and it actually did work out that um, we that we had great displays on those last two nights uh, from Alton, Norway, um, and and this second night uh, we experienced a fabulous display uh, because the sun uh, there's there's something called the KP index that that monitors you know how much activity on the sun is is going to impact. Uh, the geomagnetic activity in our atmosphere that creates aurora. And uh, it's a nine point scale. So that this last night that we got to go out, um, we had benefit of, of uh, KP five to seven, and it was just, it was just awesome. So again, if aurora chasing has ever been on your, um, you know, hypothetical list of things to do, the next few years should be great. You have to go though when it's dark at night. Don't go now because it's not dark at night in Norway. All right, so so it's just a couple of additional quick pictures from um, you know my H Alpha setup with my Quest Star. Um, this this is 
prominence and you can get this chromosphere detail and uh, we can play with different processing settings this is an in inverted image where you can see just like stuff happening you see these incredible magnetic fields and then places where uh, uh, gas or plasma is escaping um and um and it, it's, it's really interesting i i used to say like jupiter is like a circus compared to a lot of of uh, astronomy targets because there's always something going on in terms of the surface of jupiter the great red spot and, and the position of the moon so so but the sun the sun is a, like a blast right now there's always something happening on the sun and then here uh so just in the past few weeks i've also experimented with the tracking the auto guide feature and fire cap ca fire capture uh so it's another um piece of software fire capture is free and it's got great capabilities for planetary and solar imaging and one of those capabilities is um auto guiding and i just got it working with my quest star so with that i can um uh, the, the the video's probably not running that well in my Zoom, but um, you can maybe see this prominence. This is uh, the the um, material in the solar prominence, how it's evolving over a two hour period in a time lapse that I was able to shoot. And here again is a very similar image from a different day. Uh, and then uh, this one, I also got lucky. So the, this idea of, you know, what causes those aurora is it's when, um, you know, like tons of plasma, plasma breaks away from the sun towards the earth. So this is on the edge of the sun. I got lucky and, and sort of captured this, but you get the idea that this is, this is going um, off into space, but if this were happening on the face facing us, then about three days later, those tons of plasma coming off this off the sun would be hitting the earth and going past it and then uh, potentially creating aurora. Um, so uh, sometimes I, I, I will, you know, it's hard to predict when this stuff is going to happen. So I, I, you know, try to get out when I can with the setup and and it's it's again easier now for me than it ever had been before to set it up to track the sun and uh, try to be able to take these time lapse movies with my little backyard telescope. Okay, so so I hope so somebody shout out have, have are you were you able to see this the video. Yeah. yeah. Okay, great. Great. Well, thank you for shouting out. I know people are still awake then. Okay. <laughs> So let's move on to, so I'm going to get, I need to get serious because I want to talk about artificial intelligence. And before I dive into showing you some artificial intelligence image processing tricks, I want to talk about the philosophy of image processing. So this is Gronk. This is my head pasted on Gronk's body. <laughs> and I did this because I want to be clear, this is not what we're doing when we spend hours in astrophotography image processing. All right, so if it's not Photoshopping that we're doing, well, what is it? And uh, for my classes, I sort of came up with this, this thought experiment to really illustrate what, we're, what the whole point is. Um, so the, the, the thought experiment is, you know, like Fabergé egg is a, an example of, it's, it's a relatively small object, right? This is, you know, it's egg size. You could hold this in your hand, but it's got a, a, a tremendous amount of intricate detail uh, with, you know, color and uh, embossing and so on. And if there were a Fabergé egg that they determined it shouldn't really be exposed, you know, it's like the Mona Lisa, we can't keep, a daylight on it all the time. We have to protect it from the light. So you get hired to photograph it, and you know, with constraints, you got to do it from 20 feet away in a room with no windows. Can only be lit by a small defective candle. Um, but there is the opportunity to actually compare your image at the end, like to turn on the lights for a minute and just see whether you 
got it right, whether your color and detail are accurate or not. So this is analogous to what happens in um, uh, with with these deep sky targets. They're they're faint targets. They're we don't you don't see them through, you know, in with the naked eye. And maybe you can see the brightest ones like Andromeda with binoculars, but you're not going to see all all that detail without unless you have a gigantic telescope, right? So it's faint. There's a, a paucity of photons getting where they need to be. So astro image processing deals with this problem of woefully underexposed images that are kind of, they're filled with noise because uh, there's always going to be some noise from a uh, camera chip and so on. And the less signal there is, the more the noise is an issue. So, so what do you do with the woefully underexposed stuff in order to get back to the real color and detail? So the main techniques are you stacking. So like I said before, I have my images have, you know, I shoot four second exposures, but by the time I'm forming the image, I've shot a thousand of them. So that's 4,000 seconds of data that's going into my finished image. 3,600 seconds is an hour, right? So it's a little over an hour's worth of integrated photon accumulation. Uh, so stacking is is the first thing that's done. We arithmetically stack together the values in in um, those thousand images, and then stretching uh, is basically the easy. You know, so we do a lot of this. You, you start doing astrophotography. You're looking at histograms. You're stretching the data. You're basically re redistributing the values um, to get the brights bright and the blacks black. Uh, it's effective. You know, the shorthand would be it's. It's uh, uh, fancy ways of doing contrast adjustments that you might make with your iPhone photos or 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 whatever. Um, so uh, so we stack, we stretch, and that's how we get back to color to the detail. And then the images are still not perfect, but uh, you know, PixInsight is uh, and so people used to use Photoshop a lot. Any astronomical imaging software is filled with mathematical tools that are, are meant to improve detail, sharpen up the detail that you want to see, and reduce the noise. And there's a, a little bit of a push and pull between sharpening detail and the noise. If you sharpen the detail too much, you sharpen the noise and you make the image messy again. So, so a lot of the time that goes into image processing is finding the right balance for any given image between sharpening and noise reduction. But the bottom line is what we're doing is revealing detail, not altering detail. So what's the role of AI in this? So AI tools and techniques now provide another arrow in the quiver for astro image processing. And you might ask, what is it? And then instantly regret that, regret that because uh, it's here's uh, like for, for StarNet, which I'll show in a, in, in a, in a couple of minutes, uh, it, the you know technical detail is it's a convolutional residual net with encoder decoder architecture and with L1 adversarial and perceptual losses. Um, so again, I had I had a friend from the New York Club who does AI for a living. Uh, help me understand what those words mean. Don't ask me to play it back. But the key the key concept to recognize here is that um, these AI apps are kind of dividing your computer. They're, they're creating two machines. So machine A is modifying the image and it's modifying the image, not necessarily in simpler linear ways that the more conventional algorithmic tools in PixInsight, right? So you do a deconvolution and then you iterate through the deconvolution. It's kind of applying the same mathematical change in every step. The, the math is far more complex in terms of the types of adjustments that can, that can be made. So machine A is making these adjustments to the data and then turning it over to machine B to evaluate it. And machine B has been trained to look for certain types of, of image attributes. So that's the you know, AI machine learning training sets, very important. They set up, if, if you're training it to do a perfect starless image, so the people who have set those, that software up have uh, you know, uh, cre created uh, training sets of dozens of 
sort of perfect starless images that they created through more conventional techniques, but then they've now created machine. So machine B knows it when it sees it and tells machine A to stop modifying or sort of what direction to keep modifying. So this happens really fast on a, a contemporary computer. And the benefit is you don't have to tell machine A exactly what changes it, it, it needs to do. It just does stuff until it looks right. And if that sounds a little fishy, it's still, it's still legitimate. I mean, I've, so just looking up in uh, about GANs, gener Generative Adversarial Networks, uh, in, in Wikipedia, I found a link to this paper from 2017, the um, notices of the Royal Astronomical Society describing uh, the use of a GAN in this fashion to uh, take images of distant galaxies, sort of imperfect images, in this case from, they, they use stuff from Sky Survey, uh, and achieve a level of sharpening and detail in these images that they couldn't get from conventional techniques. Uh, so the, the idea of using this for astroimaging uh, has been there for a while. So I'm gonna switch now to um, the video of this demo. I theoretically could do it live, but let me use the video because I sort of stormed through it in 10 minutes and, and you'll see um, three illustrations. One is uh, the use of Starnet and Pix Insight to uh, separate nebula from stars. Then two is a commercial general photography product called Topaz, uh, to the, the Topaz Denoise AI and the way that impacts um, some, some images. And then a third illustration of just an AI feature in, again, a more conventional um, astro imaging, uh, excuse me, uh, more conventional photo processing software. So let me run this video. Uh, I may have to give me a second to get my controls up here. Let me just stop sharing for a second to open the video. Okay. Oh, I can see you're all still there. Great. Um, okay, so you also should. Uh, do that again one more time, make sure I have the uh, everything set up. Okay, so sh you should be able to hear this when I start. So the first home AI um, application I wanna demonstrate is in PixInsight and it's called Starnet. Let me open my image of M31. Uh, this is you know, highly processed, uh, worked on this a lot, very proud of this image, and, and it's quite good. Now, so, so it's an image of the Andromeda galaxy that's 2.5 million light years away. And uh, you see all these stars in the image, that's, you know, the way it looks. It's the, the thing is that most of these stars are between us and the galaxy. So suppose we wanted to know what this galaxy looked like without all those pesky stars in the way. Well, um, a, a postdoc in physical chemistry in Texas, who is an amateur astrophotographer, realized he could make a neural network program and train it to uh, do a very clean separation of stars from background. Um, and uh, so, so this, Creating a star mask is something um, that uh, there, are, there are actually multiple tools in PixInsight, uh, a number of ways to do it. It's really been a part of conventional image processing because it uh, is much better to uh, use tools that sharpen up the stars uh, separately from tools that um, if you apply them across a full image, they can make a mess of any noise in the background and in uh, structures like galaxies and nebula. So, so it's long been possible to kind of get a star mask uh, out from uh, an image. This, however, is new, and that's the uh, the ability to just quickly get a galaxy uh, without the stars. Um, and uh, so uh, if I undo it and redo it, you can see the dramatic dif difference. And um, 
this very high quality look at the uh, details of the more nebular structure. It's like a trillion stars here. You can't see every one. Uh, but together they make this familiar Andromeda galaxy and give us uh, a very fresh take on it. Um, and uh, I, I use this capability and again, you know, sort of the full processing of this image. Um, but uh, I just wanted to show that now, by the way, this that, that separation happened in 15 seconds. Uh, this is a new computer I built for myself to give me additional capabilities for um, astrophotography. Uh, it's running on the graphics processor in my NVIDIA. I, I have a gamer's video card in here. Um, the, the, these graphics processors are in high demand for mining um, of of uh, cryptocurrency and uh, and then other applications of AI because they are um, very uh, very they they handle the uh, repeated calculations that need to be done for these AI um, uh, programs uh, it, they handle them really well all right so that's my my first demo the next thing I want to show you is in uh, Topaz Denoise AI. So Topaz has a suite of, um, of AI tools that have been available for a few years. I had kind of ignored them previously, but I recently went ahead and, and bought the Denoise AI. And I, I want to show you what this does with an image of Jupiter. First, let me just turn it off. Uh, for the purposes of showing this. So, so this is an image of Jupiter that I worked on pretty hard. And on the left you have the original image and then for, and you know then it runs the AI on the right hand side and you can see the difference as you uh, apply different settings. Um, and uh, when we you know do planetary if you've done any yourself and planetary image processing, uh, people typically use, program called Registax to sharpen it up and and trust me I've done the best job I can to um, to, to make this look good and uh, if I uh, you know I, I'll display it at this sort of resolution where you know it looks pretty good the noise isn't a big problem um, let me show you what happens when we begin to adjust it if I re reduce the noise a little bit um, it sort of cleans up these grainy modeled areas, uh, but that's not what got me really excited. That instead, it's 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 this that once you clean up the background noise, then you can crank up the sharpness in a way that generates detail that I couldn't get through any other kind of process in this image. And this is very similar to what was described in that. Uh, paper that I showed in my presentation from the Royal Astronomical Society from 2017 that like, oh, they did this on images of distant galaxies in uh, serious observatories and found y you, you now have a way to extract um, more detail. And I, and I thought this, this just looked so great. I tried it with a few other images. Here's another Jupiter from last summer. And uh, and pow, it's that easy to um, to get all this additional detail in these central bands. Uh, you know the the difference between the original and the AI enhanced is is very evident and it's very simple. So I kept going and I have like one more demo to show you. My beloved crab that I wrote up for Skywatch. Um, oh look, when I apply that same AI model that was so nice on Jupiter, it, it actually makes a mess out of the image. That's not good. Um, but the software gives several different tools with different models, and um, I found a, a set of settings that actually does enable me to um, get more, uh, sharpen up um, something that, again, when I worked on this last uh, December. Uh, I got this as good as I could make it with conventional tools, and here it is, um, even sharper, even better. Uh, I, I think this is kind of amazing, and I'm pretty happy with this. And this is, you know, again, like 80 bucks, something like that. Um, so 
I'm glad I finally picked that up. And the last thing I want to show you is um, Gemstone, ACDC Gemstone is a uh, sort of general purpose photo editor, but they've added AI driven features to it. So I'd already mentioned that, you know, we, we took this elaborate trip to Norway to chase Aurora and uh, on our third night of, of Aurora Safari, we had clear skies. So two, two nights with clouds, you can't see Aurora through clouds, no matter how much Aurora there is. Uh, so we got lucky and got good weather on our third night, and I was so excited, I ran out with my tripod and set up and started shooting at this, like, look at this stuff coming through in the camera. I thought this was great. Um, and I, I, I kind of noticed uh, subconsciously that the uh, experienced guide had set up like 30 feet away so that he wouldn't have this power line in the middle of his image. Um, so, you know, I got home and was thinking about it and was like, oh, I could spend uh, $30,000 uh, for another trip to Norway and do it over. Um, and uh, or I could spend 80 bucks on some updated processing software and see uh, if I can fix my problem. So I'm using the magic eraser and just drawing my cursor across this uh, power line. And let's see what happens. And uh, again, using AI, it has done a very clean removal of the background. Undo it. Redo it. Uh, I'm really happy with how powerful this is for um, editing uh, artifacts, unwanted items out of images, and uh, improving, um, you know, getting the important stuff um, back the way I want it. So uh, that's my demo of three um, readily available. Uh, everyday AI applications uh, that can be uh, applied to astrophotography. Uh, and uh, that's the last part of my presentation tonight. So the first home AI. Um, yeah, so my, uh, my final slide here is, um, let me just get this out of the way. Um, Thanks for listening slide. Uh, I, I see a, a couple of questions in the chat. Um, so I'll, I'll answer those in a second. Um, but if uh, you're interested in learning urban astrophotography techniques, please watch for the AAA courses towards the end of the year. We haven't fully decided exactly when we're doing it or exactly what we're doing, but uh, we're thinking about it. And uh, you're welcome to follow my Instagram, uh, MTR Astro NYC or Flickr under my name. Um, where I put I put um, more complete you know sort of finished projects that are done in Flickr and Instagram I can get away with some um, crummier stuff so uh, so that's that's the end for my presentation let me answer the two questions that were in chat real fast um, can a filter attached to a cell phone camera the answer is probably but I'm not the guy to tell you how to do it so um, you you need to uh, you, you need to research that. I have done, there are devices to help you set up a cell phone over a telescope eyepiece. And I've done a lot of experimentation. I haven't really found, I've, I haven't been satisfied doing it, but there are people doing great images with iPhones through telescopes. Um, so I think if you work at it and shop around for like, so how would you get a filter into the mix? You probably can figure it out, but that would be like a whole project to do it. And then uh, John Speroni wants to know, is it, is it true? Is it true? Fire capture can record video while auto guiding through a single camera. And the answer is yes, it's true. So it's true. So thanks for listening. Or, or I, can, sorry, I have a question. Sure, go ahead. And the question is, when you do your solar time exposures, are you, are you set up equatorially or are you out best? Yeah, so I'm set up equatorially. I'm using the, um, uh, I'm using, here, let me, again, let's see if I can 
smoothly get to that picture. Um, so, so the Questar is on a motorized fork mount. This is one of the things like Questar is sort of crazy expensive for what it is. Um, but part of what it is, is, is kind of a little system um, that includes uh, a very precise um, drive. And, and I, I, and I have, um, uh, they, they sell as an option, a declination drive. So on the fork that you can't see here, there's also an additional motor. So there's two motors on here. And, um, and this is equatorial. It's aimed in my, so I do a lot of the imaging in my yard from the same location. Uh, so when I go outside and point it towards the trees, I know I, I'm very close to a polar uh, alignment, but it's daytime and there's trees and stuff. So, so I use a couple of different tricks that get kind of complicated to explain to, um, uh, to you know, basically different drift alignment techniques to fine tune that and get as good a polar alignment as I can have during the daytime. But um, you know, doing doing it a fair amount, uh, I can get past that in a few minutes at this point. Does that answer your question? You could also see um, so another part of the of the setup. Uh, you may have noticed uh, like a space blanket um, behind the telescope, and everything electronic is it's on a bench um, behind that that. That blind, that's a telegizmo solar shroud for, you know, it's 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 meant to um, put over your head when observing through a, a solar setup to block the light and have more contrast through the eyepiece, um, and the um, uh, and and the uh, the it, it it works well for because of the reflective side to uh, protect the, the laptop and uh, the Questor's controller from not being in the direct sunlight for the full time that I'm doing the imaging. See, Chris Plord um, prefers the power line. All right, it's fine. <laughs> All right, Chris, I've got I've got lots of images with power lines in them, Dif even different power lines. The Aurora Aurora up there. So, so keep in mind we're we're so far north, and that aurora when uh, when it's really active, the the locus of the activity in the atmosphere moves to more southern latitudes. So we have images where you see I think the it, the, the the two that I showed, well one is off to the east, but but we we have images sort of facing south. We were we drove north of the city of Alta. And so we're facing south and seeing this huge aurora display in front of us. The northern lights were south of where we were. Um, so uh, uh, on those nights when it was really good, there was, there was something happening in, in every direction. So yeah, I have like power lines on the other side of the road and, and other stuff in, in, in the images. Are there any other questions in the room? I have a question because I've been doing some imaging and I, I'm just getting into color imaging. I actually dove into the deep end uh, doing mono at first, but I, uh, I just started uh, doing color with a, uh, with a 294. And I'm curious about the dual band filter. So I have a, a light pollution filter that I've used for a few uh, galaxy shots. But I'm curious what's the, like, the best value uh, dual band filter. And as I've seen a lot of like the L Enhanced, L Extreme, like what's What's, which one is the, would you recommend to start with? So like big controversial topic or whatever, <laughs> I'll give you my short answer. So, and, and I assume you're up in Westchester that you're imaging from a yard that's like, you know, pretty dark, right? You're not in city kind of environment. I, I usually do most of my imaging from Port Penridge. Yeah, so um, I think the L Extreme and the L Enhance, uh, they're very restrictive. So I think they're really good if you have um, if you have mounts that can do uh, precise tracking and so on, um, I like um, for my imaging and for all the images I showed 
Uh, I'm using two different uh, IDAS filters, uh, Japanese filters, and I like the IDAS LPS V4 is a nebular filter. So the, 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 the bands that it passes are not as restrictive. They're a little wider than like the LXtreme. And so it's easier for me to get decent stars in my images and they're not like super contrasty. So I, I, the, people love the L enhance, the L extreme, they're easy to find. And a lot of people are using them successfully. I'm, I'm happier with a more permissive filter. Thanks, Mari. All right. Uh, well, Mari, thank you so much uh, for, for being here. I to do myself. Um, just a, a quick couple of notes to the folks in the room. We still got cookies left up here, so please come and uh, take your cookies so that Eric doesn't have to. Who are, who are logged on a computer that by not coming here, they're not getting the cookies. Yeah, the cookies <laughs> were presumably. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, and Charlie's got some uh, WAA uh, gear over here, so you can check that out if you're interested in the shirt. Um, that's pretty much it. So thanks, everybody. Appreciate your time. Okay. Well, thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.